Hi, my name is Barry Levy, and I want to welcome you to this webinar on the impacts of war on health and human rights. What can universities do to address these adverse outcomes? This webinar is presented by the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. And I'd like now to introduce the speakers, just to let you know the format. Um, the four of us will four of us will be making presentations. We'll have some discussion among ourselves, and then we'll open it up to a question and answer period. Uh, and then at the very end, each of us will make a, a, a brief concluding statement. So I want to introduce the other three speakers. Uh, Amy Hagopian is an educator and epidemiologist and professor of, of global health at the University of Washington School of Public Health. She has performed research on civilian mortality and childhood leukemia related to the Iraq war. She has developed and taught for the last eight years a course on war and health for medical and public health students at the University of Washington. And she is one of the organizers of the new Global Alliance on War, Conflict and Health. Leonard Rubenstein is an attorney and human rights advocate and professor of the practice at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. He served for 25 years as executive director for Physicians for Human Rights. His recent research has focused on, on attacks on healthcare during war. Len is co-founder of the Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition. And his new book is entitled Perilous Medicine, The Struggle to Protect Healthcare from the Violence of War. Jennifer Leaning is a physician and a senior fellow at the FXB uh, Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University and a former director of the center. She has had extensive experience performing research and bearing witness in war zones with a focus on documenting violations of human rights and international humanitarian law. Jennifer's new book is entitled The 1947 Partition of British India, Forced Migration and Its Rever Reverberations. Uh, I'm a physician and epidemiologist and an adjunct professor at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston and a past president of the American Public Health Association. I previously have edited uh, books, co-edited books on the health impacts of war and terrorism. And I recently wrote a book entitled From Horror to Hope, Recognizing and Preventing the Health Impacts of War. Previously, I co-authored papers on the health consequences of the uh, Iraq War and the Vietnam War. And recently with Jennifer Leaning, uh, I co-authored a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the war in Ukraine. I'm going to start the presentations today with an overview on the impacts of war on health, human rights, and the environment. So the adverse health effects of war, and let me just check if you can see my slides advancing. Okay. Um, the adverse health effects of, of war, the adverse effects of war include uh, injury, disease, and premature death, mental and behavioral disorders, violations of human rights and international humanitarian law, forced displacement, damage to civilian infrastructure, damage to the environment, diversion of human and financial resources, and more violence, not only more war, but domestic and community violence among uh, often perpetrated by military uh, personnel uh, returning back to their to their homes. Um, a few facts about uh, current and recent wars. One fourth of people worldwide, almost two billion people live in regions that are directly affected by armed conflicts. Most wars today are civil wars in low and middle income countries. And um, at least here in the United States, many of these wars are out of sight, out of mind. They don't get the public at anywhere near the public attention that the war in Ukraine is getting. In most, war, the most wars, the vast majority of deaths are among civilians. And I'm going to focus my presentation today uh, on the impact of, of war on civilians. And there's a huge diversion of human financial resources, uh, both during war and in the preparation for war. At the start, I want to make a distinction between direct deaths and indirect deaths. Direct deaths occur as a result of indiscriminate attacks. This is a picture of Osaka after indiscriminate um, carpet bombing in uh, World War II. Um, and uh, indiscriminate deaths also occur on a smaller scale, uh, uh, deaths and injuries, uh, a boy injured by a landmine in Cambodia where many landmines were deployed for many years. 
And I'm distinguishing between indiscriminate uh, deaths and, and injuries and illnesses uh, among civilians and targeted attacks, which are occurring uh, increasingly. Uh, physical and sexual attacks, um, often on women, but also on children and men. Uh, civilians are uh, targeted and attacked as a strategy of war. Here's a picture of a, a village that was attacked in Darfur, a, a picture from uh, Physicians for Human Rights uh, showing the aftermath of, of that targeted attack on civilians. Um, indirect deaths occur as a result of both damage to infrastructure, as shown here, farms, the food supply system, water treatment plants, uh, healthcare and public health services, and electrical power, communication, and transportation networks. Uh, but they also occur as a result of displacement. And a few illustrations of what I'm talking about here. Here's uh, women gathering water from the uh, Tigris River uh, in Baghdad uh, soon after, actually during the uh, Iraq, uh, the Pers Pers first Persian Gulf War in 1991, after uh, United States and Allied forces destroyed water treatment plants, uh, an example of, of dis targeted destruction of infrastructure. And another example, and uh, Len will say more about attacks on healthcare. There's a, a hospital in southern Iraq uh, that was uh, attacked uh, shortly after the Iraq war. But uh, the other major cause of indirect deaths uh, is displacement. So damage to infrastructure and displacement um, account for uh, most of the indirect deaths that occur during war. Uh, there's been an increasing number of displaced people. The top line here are internally displaced uh, people who are often worse off than refugees, represented by the middle line in this graph over time. And the bottom line is asylum seekers. This graph only goes up to uh, 2020. And this next table shows uh, uh, the numbers of displaced people, total displaced people in approximate numbers going back to 2017, but showing, showing the huge increase even since 2020, uh, largely due to uh, people uprooted uh, during the uh, war in Russia's war in Ukraine. We need to keep in mind that all these statistics are people with the tears removed. Uh, now, it turns out that the numbers of indirect deaths in most wars and in wars in the aggregate uh, the numbers of indirect deaths appear to be much greater than the numbers of direct deaths. Uh, the direct get deaths get all the coverage in the media, but the indirect deaths may occur in much larger numbers and, and hardly get any coverage at all. all. Uh, Mohammed Jawad and his colleagues at the University of London a couple of years ago published a paper based on more than a thousand armed conflicts over the period from 1990 to 2017, a 28-year period. And they found approximately, actually a little bit more than a million deaths a year. Now this was an estimate, but it was an estimate of the indirect deaths, uh, more than two thirds of which, more than 70% actually, were due to communicable diseases, maternal and neonatal diseases, and nu uh, nutritional uh, diseases. Uh, in contrast, uh, the Uppsala Conflict Data Program uh, verifies deaths, records deaths, uh, and this is both among uh, combatants and civilians, uh, ongoingly. But if you look at the data for the same period of time, the same 28-year period, they found about 50,000 deaths a year, actually a little bit less, and that's among both civilians and combatants. Now, this, no question, is an underestimate of the actual number of direct deaths, and the number of the estimated indirect deaths by uh, Jawad and his colleagues uh, might be an overestimate. But just looking at these numbers as they were have been presented, it appears even if the left number is much too small and the right hand estimate of indirect deaths is too large, um, it, it's hard to get away from the fact that indirect deaths play a prominent role, if not the major role uh, of total deaths during war. I want to talk a little bit about the indirect health impacts of war uh, that lead to these deaths, but also much morbidity. And I'll briefly discuss, touch on these five areas, malnutrition, communicable diseases, mental and behavioral disorders, adverse effects on reproductive health, and non-communicable diseases. Uh, malnutrition has a number of causes during war, including reduced food production, as we're now seeing in, the, in Ukraine, a damaged infrastructure in, in the farms and the food supply system, diversion or delay in the food supply, sometimes uh, where food uh, shipments are actually attacked, and, and restricted food import uh, during war. 
And there are a number of other issues. Children and, and, uh, and infants in particular are highest risk. They are at increased risk of infectious diseases. We can't forget about micronutrient deficiencies among pregnant women as a result. Um, restriction of food has sometimes been used as a weapon, including in current wars in Yemen and indeed even in Ukraine. And malnutrition in utero or in early childhood may actually lead to uh, coronary artery disease or other chronic non-communicable diseases years later during adulthood. Cr communicable diseases are primarily gastrointestinal diseases and respiratory diseases during war. I show some examples here. They are due to damage to healthcare facilities, water treatment plants, electrical grids, crowded living conditions, making spread of respiratory pathogens uh, much easier, weakened public health agencies, so less immunization programs, less uh, investigation of outbreaks, and increased antimicrobial resistance, which is shown to increase during war. Uh, there are a variety of, of uh, mental and behavioral disorders that occur as a result of war, as shown on this slide. And there are a large variety of reasons that contribute uh, trauma, family separation, deaths of family and friends, damage to homes and communities, loss of employment and education. I could go on and on. This is, of course, an incomplete list. Forced displacement, witnessing of atrocities, and uncertainty about the future. Uh, one could argue that in the aggregate, uh, the prevalence of the, the category with the highest prevalence of disorders is indeed mental and behavioral disorders, some of whose lasting effects you know, last an entire lifetime among the victims. Adverse reproductive uh, health impacts occur largely due to reduced care, as uh, shown here in uh, many areas, many parameters of reduced care, resulting in complications of pregnancy, maternal deaths, premature and low birth weight infants and infant deaths. And there's even some data that suggests that birth defects uh, may occur with certain exposures as a result of war. And non-communicable diseases, we're talking about cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, uh, cancer and so forth. There's increased incidence as a result of exposures during war, but also exacerbation of pre-existing cases, largely due to reduced access to medical care and medications. A recent survey by WHO, for example, showed that uh, at least a third of people in um, uh, war-affected areas within um, Ukraine, directly affected by, by the uh, fighting, uh, people have had difficulty accessing medical care, and even a higher number have had a difficulty uh, accessing medications. Adverse effects on the environment are numerous, including air pollution, uh, much, uh, many fossil fuels or much large amounts of fossil fuels are used during war, contributing, uh, uh, emitting greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change, uh, particulate matter and other pollutants from fires and explosions, burn pit emissions, which have been highlighted uh, among American military personnel in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and other chemicals, water contamination by various chemicals and untreated sewage, contamination of land, and we must not forget about landmines and um, unexploded ordnance. Landmines now cover more than a quarter of the territory in Iraq deployed by Russian forces. Uh, but land uh, that is and soil contaminated by heavy metals and other hazardous materials and the mil military activities themselves and, and military equipment uh, damaging uh, uh, land and uh, animal uh, habitats. This is a picture by Arthur Westing taken years ago in Vietnam showing mangroves destroyed by Agent Orange. And we must not forget about ionizing radiation, contaminating uh, air, water, and land potentially uh, due to damage to nuclear power plants, or potentially the use of dirty bombs, that is explosives with radioactive materials. And also, we also must not forget about the uh, potential use of nuclear weapons and the need to totally eliminate uh, no nuclear weapons. Uh, there are a lot of specific things that can be done to minimize uh, the uh, adverse effects on war on civilians, such as better protecting them during war, protecting civilian infrastructure, um, reducing the use of indiscriminate weapons, uh, and so forth. But the only way to totally eliminate the impacts of war on health, human rights, and the environment is to eliminate war itself. Uh, there are a variety of, of approaches, including resolving disputes nonviolently through diplomacy, arms control, and measures to defuse conflicts and to prevent the spread of violence. 
uh, addressing the root causes of war is vitally important, including militarism, socioeconomic inequities and poverty, ethnic and religious hatred, poor governance, and stresses on the environment. And, and it's important to, to strengthen the infrastructure for peace um, uh, before war occurs, uh, but certainly in the aftermath of war as well, to rehabilitate nations and reintegrate people, establishing truth and reconciliation commissions, deploying international peacekeepers, strengthening civil society, promoting the rule of law, and ensuring citizen participation. And a brief note to say that we must not forget that there's a, a lot of evidence to show that when women participate in the uh, strengthening of, of the infrastructure of peace and building peace after conflict, it's more likely that that peace will be sustainable. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the uh, the three parts of one might think of a, a triangle um, in terms of what can be done to prevent war and promote peace, resolving disputes nonviolently, reducing the underlying causes of war, and strengthening the infrastructure for peace. So I provide that as an overview for the more specific presentations that will follow. And next, uh, Amy Hagopian will present on... Uh, teaching opportunities on war and health, and she will focus on observations and insights from teaching her course. Amy? Yes, I think you have to take your slides down for me to start mine. Thank you. All right, everybody, it's wonderful to see your names in the <clears throat> list of participants and there are many of you here, about 100, so I really appreciate your attendance today. I'm going to talk to you about a class I teach at the University of Washington on War and Health, hoping it will be inspirational for others to teach similar classes. And first, I'd like to acknowledge my colleague and friend, Evan Cantor, who worked for some years as a psychiatrist for the VA during the Iraq War where he treated PTSD and veterans. He's also been president of National Physicians for Social Responsibility and authored this PSR report in 2007. Students love him. Uh, a decade ago, my friend Shelley White worked with Bernie Lown, uh, who unfortunately died in February of 21, to measure the number of courses offered in US schools of public health on the topic of war and conflict. They found only 2% of courses included any content on war among the topics taught with little attention to prevention or militarism. It's not among the accreditation competencies for public health students, despite being a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. Nonetheless, we've done an inventory of universities teaching war and health courses or material across the globe, and it's not inconsiderable. It would be good to have an official directory somewhere, perhaps on the website of the Global Alliance on War, Conflict, and Health, which Barry earlier mentioned. And uh, here, by the way, is a way to reach the Global Alliance if you'd like to go to that website. Uh, the Peace Caucus of the American Public Health Association had a working group on the primary prevention of war that Shelley White led. And we wrote this paper in 2014 uh, suggesting some war-related competencies that public health students should acquire in their training programs. The topic categories include militarism, international peace work, peace advocacy, and peace research. And one of our co-authors on that paper is Bill Whist, uh, who also wrote this complimentary paper on topics related to war using a complex modeling approach. Obviously, there's a lot to study here. So an introductory survey course on war could be followed by more specialized courses in any of these subtopics. And as academics, the most obvious thing we can do is teach. We can introduce war and conflict topics to the next generation of public health professionals. So it becomes part of a long game to change attitudes in the profession. We've taught our UW course on war and health for eight years now. It's popular as a mixed undergrad and graduate course. And when they enter the class, each student selects a study war, which becomes the lens through which they learn about the health effects of war generally. 
And this is our menu of study wars. And for a variety of reasons, we restrict the number of wars students can select from, uh, and the reasons are mostly practical. We give students a choice of two short, easy to read books to discuss as a class at the end of the quarter. Uh, and in discussing these books, we have students use a floor thermometer technique to measure their level of agreement on controversies in the books. Our learning objectives include health effects, conflict analysis, weaponry, torture, refugees, soldiers, militarism, structural violence, the role of health professionals in preventing war, stakeholder analysis, and discussion group skills. Each Thursday, students post a paragraph or two in our learning management system discussion page in response to the question of the week, and they read each other's posts before class on Friday morning. Grad students lead the Friday morning discussion sections populated with a student from each of the study wars so students can learn about each other's wars in those Friday discussions. Students write a simple descriptive midterm paper on the health effects of their own study wars. Mid-quarter, we have students meet by war, that is all the students assigned to a particular war meet together. And we ask them to diagram the causes and health consequences of their wars with an eye to noticing where interventions might have offered opportunities for primary, secondary, or tertiary prevention. It's one of my favorite moments in the course. I'll share some photos of students at work diagramming their wars. They're kind of fun. It's amazing the variety of ways of depicting these things. And of course, sometimes one board, one war connects to the other across the room, and that becomes obvious to people. Uh, when we have veterans, when we have our veteran and refugee panels, students like to meet with the panelists for additional time after class, which we arrange. We bring the same veterans year after year, and they've developed a rapport with each other, which is really interesting to watch. Um, each year, we focus on a different refugee experience, however. Last spring, our refugees were from Afghanistan, as Seattle now has about 3,000 Afghan refugees. We also require the undergrads in the class to engage in a pro-peace activism activity for 10% of their grade. We're very liberal in uh, allowing a wide variety of activities. So students participated in Black Lives Matter work and all sorts of different activities. Uh, and of course, sometimes during the course of the quarter, there's breaking news. In the fall of 2020, the UN achieved the milestone of 50 nations ratifying the 2017 Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. We also had to stop and notice the invasion of Iraq, sorry, of Ukraine. There are lots of text materials for a class. Our Peace Caucus group wrote this book on the prevention of war a few years ago. And of course, Barry Levy's new book came out this year designed specifically for teaching because in the course of 15 chapters, uh, uh, it covers a wide variety of topics suitable for course use, one chapter per topic. For two years now, we've made the final assignment a mock hearing in front of the House Armed Services Committee, assigning students to deliver testimony on behalf of various stakeholders to promote or oppose a bill to discontinue the ICBM weapons system. Evan and I are represented in Congress by Adam Smith, who serves as chair of the House Armed Services Committee, and he loves to come speak to the class about nuclear weapons ahead of the hearing. At the height of the pandemic, we taught the course twice through Zoom, which wasn't as much fun, of course, but showed it could be done. And there are also online courses such as the University of Bergen's Medical Peacework MOOC course and one by NextGenU Org. And if your school doesn't have a course on war, you can start small with a one credit class using guest lecturers. Consider those competencies in the AJPH article as you design the course. And I promise you that everyone across the country who teaches a war on a course on war will gladly share their syllabus with you. We're all evangelicals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy. Our next presenter is Lynn Rubenstein. His presentation today 
will focus on research, advocacy, and solidarity with those affected by war. Hi, everyone. Uh, I, I appreciate CUHGH uh, having this conversation. I think if there's a takeaway from the fact of this conversation, as well as the content, is that while war is one of the most profound um, aspects of deprivation of health and its consequences for health probably outweigh any other single cause, and yet war is still a very marginal topic in the public health field. Uh, so that's a huge problem, but it's also uh, an opportunity for universities to get further involved. And I want to look at two issues, uh, one about research and one about advocacy and solidarity. Uh, and I'm going to use my own experience uh, in work on violence against healthcare and conflict. It's the work I do, it's what I mo know most about. Uh, so just use it as an example, but that's just an example. Uh, first is an indication of the state of knowledge. Colleagues and I uh, did a systematic review looking at all academic articles, looking at violence against healthcare over the last 40 years. And, <laughs> We only found a few dozen. It was astonishing, around one a year. And most of those were in the last 10 years. 89% were in the last 10 years. And so we can see how barren the literature is. And it's an area, of course, where students and young academics certainly can focus because there's so much that needs to be done. Uh, at the same time, there are some initiatives that show how important it is to study. For example, over the last decade, there has been a lot of interest in improving data collection on violence against healthcare, and the World Health Organization has been mandated to collect and disseminate this kind of uh, tracking of, of the attacks. But it's a very complex undertaking and involves issues around what counts as an attack, what happens when you don't have access, which allows you to determine uh, that an attack happens, uh, questions of what kind of sources you rely on, what methods there are for a verification. And so there's room for academic research in this area. And, and this is some work I did with colleagues uh, back in 2016, when we were trying to develop a particular way of tracking attacks. Uh, and there's much more work needed. Also, over the last five years, there we've talked about the consequences of war. Uh, there has been almost no serious academic research on the consequences of attacks on healthcare, on health, health systems, uh, usually because it's difficult to separate out the impacts of the war itself from the impacts of attacks. So a consortium of universities involving the University of Manchester, University of Geneva, Berkeley, Geneva, Berkeley, and Johns Hopkins created this consortium uh, to do research in different countries, uh, Afghanistan, Central African Republic, uh, and others, Colombia, uh, to not only start doing this research, but to develop methods that will yield good results. So here again, there are just terrific opportunities to develop methods and start illuminating questions that can not only show what's happening, but can influence policy. The second point I want to address is the role of universities in solidarity and advocacy. You know, uh, advocacy for a long time was a dirty word in academia. 
it was considered a breach of standards of academic inquiry, that it was too uh, likely to result in bias, that academics should uh, be, if not objective, they should be disinterested. And the one minute you get into advocacy, you cross a line. But that is really changing. And I not only is it changing, uh, it's really essential because the research that can be done at a university level can have a, an enormous uh, effect in amplifying the voices of that community. And there are a few ways that's starting to happen. Uh, I, I chair the Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition, and, and we now have in this coalition uh, about four uh, academic centers that are part of this coalition. And this coalition um, advocates with UN agencies, uh, makes its voice heard in Congress, uh, uh, and with um, with European and other governments, and it organizes meetings of ministers of health around the world, especially in conflict countries. And having uh, universities participate this both strengthens their own commitments and strengthens the coalition itself. We also crossed a, a very important threshold, I think, in the war in Ukraine. It was really the first time uh, the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health, which is the kind of the trade association or the professional association of public health schools and other public health programs, actually took a, made a statement condemning the, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in the past, this was considered too political and universities should not institutionally uh, get involved but this association did it and members did. The same thing happened in Europe, the European Association of Schools and a global network also took a position. So I think that that adds to the voices uh, around the world of opposition and condemnation that cumulatively can make a difference and kind of sitting on your hands from the public health world where we know the horrors of war and the impacts as Barry explained, uh, it can't just be set aside. There's a second dimension too. Uh, there's three, three uh, pictures here uh, involving, they're all Syrians uh, who got scholarships to Johns Hopkins to get a master's degree in public health. I think universities can and should offer scholarships to, to people from around the world, not just from Syria. Uh, this scholarship is open, it started with Syrians, but now it's open to others uh, to, to, um, to help them uh, in their, use public health knowledge in their own countries. Um, uh, on the left is Mohammed Darwish, who's now working for the UN. On the top right is Hussan Alahas, who now is working for Physicians for Human Rights. And on the bottom is Taysir Al Karim, who has been working in humanitarian work and actually has been delayed in coming uh, for his MPH because uh, the US government has delayed his visa, but he'll be here uh, next year. And so I think this is one thing for universities to consider. And I think it's worth going to your deans and saying, we should be doing this. If we're committed on issues around war, we ought to bring people from these countries on a full scholarship to our school. Uh, Finally, I want to, it's, I don't have a slide on this, but solidarity is incredibly important. People, health workers under attack all over the world uh, deserve our support, deserve our uh, consideration. They are putting themselves at risk. They're in incredibly difficult situations. And even if we can't do anything to help them in the moment, knowing that they have support of their colleagues abroad is really important. So statements, 
and expressions of solidarity uh, are meaningful to people in these difficult situations. So I'll stop there and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Len. Appreciate your presentation. Jennifer Leaning is next, and she's going to focus on what Americans need to understand about the plight of civilians in the midst of war and what universities can do to assess situations that may lead to armed conflict. Jennifer? Yes, um, thank you, Barry. Uh, and uh, I appreciate this opportunity. It is, it is a very important set of topics. Uh, and what I would like to talk about um, is the this overall topic of uh, civilians in war or civilians and war and uh, point out that um, the public health discourse on war has increased um, enormously, both in <clears throat> complexity um, and scope and depth over the last 30 years. Um, and there have been a number of precursor organizations that have been very involved in this. Um, work and this these developments, I think. Um, I've been associated closely with two of them, Physicians for Social Responsibility and Physicians for Human Rights. Um, and for a large share of my time at, at PHR, Len was the executive director. So we share sort of common approaches and understandings. Um, and uh, I think the work on getting this topic into uh, schools of public health and then universities more generally, um, is uh, accelerating as both Amy and uh, Lynn and even Barry have of have described or hinted at. Uh, the the key points that I think need to be uh, understood here um, are that the these wars <clears throat> are primarily internal wars. Uh, that is wars that are civil wars. That is one population against the government or several populations against each other with the evaporation of government or the collapse of government, um, or they are um, internationalized internal conflicts. Here I'm using a, a term from the International Committee of the Red Cross and international humanitarian law. They, these wars begin as internal wars and then an external state, independent state intervenes and usually messes it up even further. Um, we've seen that in uh, Syria. Uh, so the um, international attention now in the war in Ukraine, I think is doing, um, if there's anything positive about it, the international attention has accelerated a world understanding about the impact of war on civilians and civilian infrastructure. Uh, one of the reasons that the discourse on war and the public health discourse on war is increased is that there's increasing targeting of civilians in these internal wars um, and commission of atrocities, which we can get into in the discussion. And a growing percent of civilian casualties over the last <clears throat> 100 years um, has um, uh, become astonishing, definitely over 90% of casualties in war now are not military, but they're civilian. And uh, that has real implications for public health, for what uh, physicians and other um, medical professionals attempt to do in this context, um, and in terms of the prospects for post-conflict rebuilding and reconciliation. A point I'd make here though, in terms of the uh, parameters of war that we need to study in any formal way are that <clears throat> the attacks on civilians directly precipitate extensive forced migration. And the forced migration from war is an extraordinary problem uh, in terms of how does one um, bring back society from war, heal its wounds, and um, it, prepare it to face um, its next generation of work. Uh, and this is been driven home extensively now with um, you know, 7.8 um, million, the number of fluxes, but 7.8 million civilians um, forcibly driven out of uh, or fleeing the war in Ukraine. Uh, but Syria also had massive civilian internal and external displacement, and that is in recent memory. So we, 
we're facing um, the disruptive effects of war that are now um, showing up as highly distressed and in some ways deeply wounded populations that are seeking um, access to the first world that is not um, directly targeted or engaged in these wars. From a standpoint of how a university or a public health school might approach um, a uh, curricula on war, there are really very important research and policy areas I'd suggest. Um, one would the, be the epidemiology of morbidity and mortality. Uh, that is who suffers, why, what are the vulnerabilities? It's a quite complicated topic. It varies from uh, war to war and, and state to state, but it is um, pretty essential if you're trying to understand the wounds of war on civilian populations, uh, the patterns. That's what I'm talking about. And then another category of work um, that comes from a different perspective, not epidemiology, but more um, fields that are active in international human rights, international humanitarian law, what involves protection of civilians from the adverse effects of armed conflict. So early warning to see what's going on and begin to understand how you have to intervene against both human and ecological catastrophes and, and atrocities and uh, the forced migration that these atrocities, um, because they're so ferocious, um, instill. <clears throat> People flee. They flee ugly and dirty wars uh, because they are the targets. And then another area to look at, which is um, a, sort of in the humanitarian and policy and political world, which is what does one um, speak about when you talk about post-conflict, I'm putting that in quotes, stabilization. There's no definite point of post-conflict. That, that's the sort of terrible point about these wars. They drag on, not just in hearts and mind, but in the devastated landscape, um, the wounds and illnesses and disabilities inflicted by the war, the profound grief, which can also be part of a profound interest in revenge. Uh, so this, this has many parameters for different um, disciplines to study and um, lime out in ways that we can work with from the standpoint of how do you intervene, how do you help? Um, we know that stabilization, which it, it essentially tries to um, cease active conflict, um, it requires local leaders and local health workers, absolutely crucial. Crucial, And I think one of the points that everyone here on this um, panel has learned over time is that um, health is highly damaged and is one of the most important things to try to restore when one is thinking about bringing people back up on their feet um, and uh, collectively working together to remake their, their country. Uh, and then a fascinating and related, but also independent field of study is the impact of international humanitarian aid organizations, and here including um, a, um, the non-governmental ones and the ones that are, um, uh, a, that are local NGOs. Um, and uh, MSF has achieved the status of almost the major international humanitarian aid organization. And then there's the International Committee of the Red Cross, which has a special pivotal role in the international community with the UN and with um, armed forces. But there are these are areas that if you are assigning research topics or you're developing curricula or you want to have one, one whole course, these are really important areas from my perspective that are um, ripe and, and underway in terms of um, research and right for student and graduate student um, assessment. And if you are thinking about how you apply the public health methods to analyzing um, the morbidity and mortality of civilians in war, um, then just think about these parameters. How do you track casualties by time, place, and location? This also deals with um, attacks on healthcare, you know, tracking the attacks on the facilities by time, place, and location. That's what we're doing. Assessing causes of death and disease and forced flight. This is where I have spent a good part of my work. Um, it, defining the differential impacts on vulnerable populations, also crucial because uh, vulnerability has many forms and um, wars also have many forms. Uh, so there are issues about how boys 
are uh, affected. Clearly, we've talked about vulnerable populations from the standpoint of sexual assault. Um, there are enormous number of geospatial and um, indirect modes of ascert ascertainment of damage and flight, which are um, very technical but fascinating and ones we all need to uh, become more familiar with. And then there's um, estimating projected civilian casualties based on known patterns of morbidity and mortality. In other words, this is what we see. If the war continues, this is what we're going to see over the next two months, over the next two years. We actually know quite a lot about how we can build those estimates. Now, the role of universities, I think, um, which is a topic for um, the, the convening organization, um, is to work on research, the impact of war on civilians along the parameters, um, at least of what I have suggested as being very interesting and current and relevant, training health professionals and students in how to um, assess and understand violations of international human rights and humanitarian law, because these are the norms that apply in war. There's public health, but uh, there's also um, a, a very articulated and important and influential uh, set of international precepts and um, legal uh, frameworks through which one understands um, and assesses the um, cruelty of war and its illegality. Uh, and then policy development about how can um, professionals, governments, international institutions um, participate in the development of modes of um, protection of civilian populations and civilian assets like uh, museums and forests and water and um, artifacts from centuries ago. Um, the response, um, that is how to intervene as part of protection. And then prevention, which has um, a concept of early warning, anticipatory um, uh, understanding of what's going to come next and intervening early as in disease. I don't want to use the disease metaphor too much, but um, intervening early if the war can be very useful, although one has to have a sense of what's possible and what isn't. Um, the, I, I'm going here now to uh, two instances of what um, I'd like to talk about, um, the sort of uh, instincts one needs to develop if you're actually in um, active wars or in post-conflict settings or in immediate refugee settings, uh, where you're dealing with a very, very damaged and um, injured populations, and you're also trying to deal with a local context, and you're almost always having to use interpreters. So this comes from a, a PHR um, initiative where um, I was uh, involved is, with colleagues on um, assessing early days of the war in Afghanistan. So this was in January of 2002. The war, as you recall, began after September 11th. Um, and there was extensive bombing and invasion of Afghanistan uh, in the late fall of 2001 after 9-11. And this is a prison that was not yet visited and reported on in January of 2002 that had an incredibly complicated history associated with war atrocities. Um, on the part of the Taliban and, in fact, the Northern Alliance. And it was a miserable place holding thousands of prisoners. And these are Pakistani Taliban um, who had been part of the war, who had been picked up by the Northern Alliance and shoved into this massive prison uh, with minimal um, food. Uh, it's freezing cold. These are open to the air. This is January. Uh, and horrible water and sanitation um, packed into cells. And it took quite a lot of effort and delicacy on the part of um, John Heffernan and me, who, the two of us were doing this investigation, to get to this place. Um, and our interpreter <clears throat> was a young man who fled the, his family had fled the Afghanistan war. He had lived in Pakistan, Peshawar, for years. And he fortunately understood a number of languages from South Asia as well as Afghanistan. And he was interpreting um, what these men were saying in their cell. And to get there, we had to get the um, consent of the prison warden, which was complicated in itself. 
So you can hear the layers here of what you have to know and understand in order to get to some information from people who have really suffered, um, whose voices have not yet been heard, whose situation casts light on the underlying microdynamics of one region of one war. Um, and um, just to have you uh, recognize that there are um, key issues in working with interpreters. And this young man was freezing. He didn't have the right winter clothes. I had come with a proper hat that I'd bought in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, because I knew it was cold there. He was so cold so that I gave him my hat. He's now wearing it uh, in this photograph. Um, he kept it on. I mean, it was his from then on. And um, that he was, he was our buddy. I mean, we relied on him for so much. So choosing the right interpreter is an art form in itself on these investigations. A another instance, which again involves interpreters, um, sort of arduous circumstances, again, a PHR um, investigation into what was happening to the refugees that were just starting to flee across the border from the war in Darfur. So this was in April of, um, or May of 2004. And we were talking to people who had just arrived over the border from Darfur into Chad. Um, legal complication is that we could not go into Darfur because we were a national legitimate human rights organization from the United States. And uh, you, we could not have gotten visas from the government of Sudan to go into Darfur. So we had to figure out what was going on from the adjacent country, Chad. So just to give you a sense, um, I'm there, it's, extremely hot. Um, the man in the white robe is the village headman of a village in Darfur. They had come back to the refugee camps and were set, resettling as a village. Those who came across, about half survived that village attack. I'm asking his permission if I could talk to the women about who are in the refugee camp about what they had experienced during the attacks um, against them in Darfur. 50, 60, 80 miles across the border. I have two sets of interpreters with me because um, they speak different languages and I have to go through two different languages um, to talk to this head man. And the woman was fluent in several of the African languages and also French. Um, and the man in the baseball cap was fluent in Arabic. And so depending on what language is being used, um, I had to, talk with a woman in French, my French is not great, in order to get the questions across. And it was um, very, very tricky to do this. And the again, this is the issue of logistics, location, um, cultural awareness, language problems. And my bonds with these two interpreters were not quite as strong as they were with my young colleague from Afghanistan, but they were basically crucial to the ways in which one could conduct an investigation. So I would just say that um, there's so many things that universities could be teaching about uh, conflict and its um, impact on, on civilian populations, uh, ranging from these um, sort of small scale points that I raised right at the end, but also the, the lessons learned in policy de development, which I don't think I will, um, uh, spend time reading. War hurts civilians for a long time. Certain kinds of weapons and wars are particularly deadly to civilian life, survival, and long-term uh, recovery. Um, prevention and mitigation are absolutely crucial because there's no such thing as a cleanup after a war. There really isn't. Um, and that we um, can really contribute to this um, set of processes by training um, the next generation and how to participate in analytic early warning, development of options, and um, through investigations and policy and advocacy of uh, supporting populations through hard times. And these are indeed hard times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I'd like to uh, first ask if Amy or Lynn want to make any further comments uh, uh, before posing some other questions. Thanks, Barry. I'm always happy to jump in. <laughs> I think one thing we don't 
sort of talk much about when we speak of our work in this space is how is it supported? And, you know, many of us are on soft money having to raise our own salaries and there is very little actual cash to aim at this topic in the academic space. Um, for example, all the NIH units that ought to be interested in this topic um, are mostly aimed at body parts rather than causes related to war and conflict. Um, it sort of reminds me of the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, the American Lung Association, which were basically all driven by cigarettes and yet divided themselves into these units that didn't acknowledge the underlying cause of all the illness that they were working on. Um, so I think that's a thing that a challenge that we really face in this work is uh, encouraging the scientific funding agencies to start thinking about this in a more direct way. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Lynn, do you, yeah, you, I, I, you I want to exactly, ask? Um, uh, there's a question by Catherine uh, in the in the Q and A, which asks uh, um, how to enhance partnerships, and I think one of the major obstacles to partnerships is the lack of this funding. It's a huge issue, um, and there are humanitarian groups that manage to find funds to engage in research projects, uh, but mostly they're about service quality and and evaluation. Uh, so I don't want to blame it all on the donors, but it still is a major issue. Another another question in the chat is, uh, what about mental health in terms of uh, what more can, in effect, universities do to address the uh, many mental health issues related to war? Wondering if any of you want to address that. Jennifer, please. Please. It's a it's a profound and um, crucial question, and of course, um, filled with complexity. The minute you utter it, um, in um, most settings, um, getting people settled. This is now the people affected by war, um, in some mode of safety from immediate attack, um, food, water. Um, it sort of essential and, and, and necessary healthcare, um, and then um, safety and care for their children, uh, getting the families together to the extent that one can find them, um, and being somewhere distant from the front line. These are all um, the sort of health interventions one can do that contribute to supporting mental health. But the fund, so so physical and family security and um, medical health care and food and water <clears throat> uh, and shelter, all crucial. Um, it, is, it is in promotion of mental health that one has to do that as well as for all the other reasons. You can't do mental health work unless people have these needs satisfied. Uh, however, you could do some assessment as you're providing those needs. And uh, the... We, I'm going to leapfrog over the really hard stuff, which is what do you do when people are acutely psychotic, acutely traumatized, um, have fallen into sort of inanition or even um, hysterical reactions because of the horrors of what they've seen or experienced. That is the toughest because it really requires a fair amount of sophistication to deal with. Um, the longer term issues are that they recognize that people are going to have um, a tremendous trail of depression and anguish and flashbacks and rage, et cetera. Uh, I don't mean to say et cetera in the sense that it's, the list is very long. Um, the, the humanitarian aid community over the last um, 20 years has gotten pretty sophisticated at recognizing when they're dealing with mental health issues, once they have people um, in groups or families and can do some assessments. Um, and the, I, I have found that it's really important for 
people who are um, mentally as well as physically ill, psychologically distressed, <laughs> to realize that the outside world is coming to see you. The humanitarian aid community, the Red Cross flag uh, and the, or MSF flag with the Red Cross flag, you know, flying over the tents, um, the tracing capacities of the international community of the Red Cross. There's always a little dusty desk in an office where you could go and see, put your name down and say you're looking for, you know, the five people that you love you whom you can't find. Uh, knowing that there is, uh, it's not just a sense of mercy, but it's a sense of informed competence that is being brought from the outside world to the site of the of the misery and um, the adjacent to the kinetic war zone. This is a really important aspect of what we, as a um, world of first world of safety, so to speak, um, must strengthen and participate in um, to um, support people who have been hit by these wars. And then the other thing is clearly um, people who are refugees, want to flee, um, can't go back. We need to be opening our doors. Um, and and that is a, another discussion of tremendous complexity. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. The, the, the uh, subtitle of this webinar is what can universities do to address these adverse outcomes? And we've already had a number of excellent suggestions having to do with, among other areas, training, education, research, advocacy, policy development, solidarity. But I, I think we should also talk a little bit more about how. Um, and and you know we've touched on several things already. One is the the lack of adequate funding and and trying to think of ways to increase the funding. Uh, Len uh, gave an example of um, you know training, bring, bringing people from other countries either here or to other. Um, places where they could get uh, public health education and so forth and go back to their their uh, countries and and uh, you know provide uh, assistance or or be on the faculty in those uh, the universities in other countries more directly affected by war but I, I I'd like to talk more about how um, we can bring about change uh, you know my observation is that uh, often uh, this subject get, gets covered because there are people like Amy and Evan Cantor at the University of Washington and elsewhere, and people like Jennifer and Len, who are, you know, uh, leading the effort and, and uh, you know, building linkages, building support within their universities. But I, I'd like to have have us talk a little bit about uh, more about how how um, how this could happen and, and the role that CUGH or individual universities can play uh, to have to, you know, to facilitate this. <clears throat> That's a hard question. Amy, do you want to jump in or? Well, one thing that I think about a lot is, uh, especially just fresh coming from the American Public Health Association meeting in Boston, is how much war drives local health responses. That is, our state and local health departments are asked to do a lot of war cleanup in ways that they don't even recognize they're doing. And when Jennifer talks about the mental health responses, these are showing up, as you said in your introduction, Barry, in the living rooms and bedrooms across America for returning veterans who are traumatized uh, and the children of those people uh, and refugees and asylum seekers worldwide. Um, and yet our state and local public health people are not making these connections to the underlying causes of these problems that they are asked to clean up after, frankly. And universities, I think, could do a better job of connecting the dots on these topics and encouraging state and local health people to document what they're seeing. Uh, and participate in research to make these connections clearer. Len or Jennifer, do you want to comment more on? Thank you, Amy. Sure, uh, on, I, would, on how... I would say, first of all, I think CUGH has a very important role because it convenes universities. And I think there could be steps taken, not simply to have sessions at the annual meeting, although that's important, 
uh, but to increase the comfort level of deans in doing this work. Uh, now, the deans, like everybody else in this field, are dependent on funding and where the money is. But even so, um, there's uh, there are opportunities for leadership. And I'll go back to that Ukraine letter because it was just a simple letter. Um, and, and it started with the dean at Johns Hopkins and then she took it to the rest of the deans. And I think there was good feeling about it. They were pleased that they had spoken out and they didn't get terrible pushback either, which is always the fear that there will be a political cost to take. And I think uh, increasing discussion among leaders in the academic world, uh, bringing together uh, discuss convening discussions on how schools of public health or programs in public health can, can more um, robustly engage in research and other activities is really worth it. And it could have an impact, whether it's on expanding the curriculum or finding small research opportunities or uh, training programs or any of the other things we've talked about. Uh, so I think that's an, a, it's not the only thing we should do. And it's not going to solve the entire problem. But I think having academic leadership would make a big difference. Yeah. Let, um, Jennifer, please. Thank you, Lynn. Jen. Uh, thank you. I I agree with what Lynn has said, and I'm struck by the wise uh, questions. Um, Catherine's, that is, how can we sort of combine forces? And then concerns about... Um, is this going to be perceived as political um, when we get into discussions of war? Uh, and I think that um, has been a real barrier for universities. Um, and it's interesting because universities are now buffeted by a range of um, movements that I would say have so sort of profound political implications in terms of Black Lives Matter and looking at the role of slavery and um, ways in which racism has pervaded the United States. I mean, these, these, are, these are topics that, um, whether universities want to handle them or not, they are being forced to handle them because they are coming from huge demand from our you know, <clears throat> complex society uh, and our student body. And, and so suddenly there's, um, certainly on the Harvard campus, um, enormous number of um, fora for talking about these issues and gaining sophistication about them. Um, so I would say that um, a groundswell uh, could be generated uh, were we taking in more refugees and local boards of health and school systems were really working with um, the people that um, are fleeing these wars. Amy, I really agree with you. Um, but, but the United States is somewhat insulated However, um, I believe that uh, consortia, uh, so I didn't know, Amy, what you were teaching until we sort of <laughs> met you in this the preparation. Um, and there are, I know what Hopkins is doing. Um, you know, I've been working uh, with a number of colleagues and you know, co-founded the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And we have, Setters that are now working on very aspect, various aspects of war. I believe that there, there's a, a rapid leapfrog. If there was somebody or a subcommittee, I'm looking at the consortium, uh, that had as a purpose to say, what are you doing in the university and how could you um, interact with sharing curricula, having joint programs? You know, there's, there, Zoom has really made a lot of. Um, uh, possibilities open, joint letters on the on the scale of what um, Len was talking about, I think we could kind of bootstrap our way into having this be a much more prominent discussion of learning and teaching. Um, and from that, there will definitely be some advocacy. Amy, I see you smiling. Do you want to make any further comment at this point or not? Oh, just amen, sister. Can I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> you can. Yeah, yeah. There's, it really strikes me that so much can be done in in, uh, in partnership and and building a, a critical mass of, of people who really can make a difference on a on a global scale. And I, 
you know, I, I think we may be at, at that point where, um, you know, between the global alliance that we talked about earlier and, and uh, so many other efforts, uh, efforts that Len, you're working in, Jennifer, um, uh, work, work through um, the World Federation of Public Health Associations. I mean, all, all these um, structures uh, related to public health, for example, that uh, exist that really don't um, focus very much on, on war. I mean, from, from state and local health departments, as uh, I think Amy said a few minutes ago, to um, you know, international uh, organizations, so there really is an opportunity there. Um, there, there also are some uh, funders coming onto the world stage, like Jeff Bezos, who uh, may be willing to give some of his money towards supporting efforts like this. <laughs> but uh, um, only if we can convince Dolly Parton. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, so I, there, I also, I'd it, also like to um, underscore what um, Len was saying about training people who are intrepid in surface through all sorts of the idiosyncratic ways to our attention, arising mm -hmm. from the war in their own country, uh, who are going to be, you recognize them, you meet them there, or you know somebody who has met them and you meet them there again, or you're doing research and suddenly uh, that person shows up. Uh, Hussan was um, somebody we brought over to the FXB Center, part of my work with the Lancet Commission on Syria, because I met him over, I met him, um, in a variety of settings. And uh, he's a great asset. Um, and he's just a particular example. Um, I know colleagues at Yale are working closely with Syrian doctors and medical students um, mm -hmm. in training them. They have some that they have there trained. Some of whom are on this on this webinar, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So um, there, there's a lot of um, activity going on that is not kind of brought to the forefront for everyone to see what the actual smorgasbord looks like right mm -hmm. now. I think there's, um, I know there's a lot more activity on teaching about war and engaging mm -hmm. the younger generation in research on these issues mm -hmm. um, than there has been um, in, more in the last four or five years than I than I've ever seen. And I think it's a it's a really rich time to begin to engage. And mm -hmm. and I would say that. Um, it's starting to stop being a cowboy operation. In other words, that there's an intrepid person who goes out and learns everything about the wars in the Congo. Um, uh, there are a couple of them at Columbia who are just amazing. They come out of the CDC and the Epidemiologic Intelligence Service and they're, um, a, you get a sense of my God, what have they done? How are they doing that? They're so great. They know more um, about the methods than, you know, I mean, I remember um, my feeling, wow, these, these guys are wonderful. I would like to learn from them. And, and so the, the people who've been the most um, inspiring are uh, many of the people have actually done the early work and then they become teachers. Yeah. And then they began to gather other people around them. And I think that's the sort of spark, spark plug that we're now at. There are more people, there are more people like us that are doing this. And yeah. also more people who are um, considerably younger than us who are doing it. Right. And so we, we need to start communicating. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Jennifer, just drawing on your phrase, uh, uh, gathering the people around them, you know, many of us are either in full time or, or affiliated with academic institutions where the resources to address these problems are, are there. You know, it's a, it's a question of creating the incentives and, and indeed, as Amy said, the funding to, you know, get people to um, spend their their activities, uh, educational research advocacy, you know, in, the, in this area. And, and that's often, at least in academia, dictated, I think, by the, the funding opportunities and, 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 and also in relation to what Len said, how, how deans and department chairs reward you know, academic uh, activities. Uh, some get rewarded more than others, and and you know, clearly, this is an area that deserves more more reward uh, than it, than it's uh, getting. I'm talking internally within universities. Further comments? Yeah, I mean, for instance, Alain Hopkins has really um, raised his profile in the last five years on these issues around wars. Um, the tracking of casualties um, has been a very major. Uh, uh, support to a lot of the analysis um, and um, the centers you direct. Um, I mean, there are two centers that are 
working on this at, in Hopkins, right? I mean, it's uh, we have not quite the same infrastructure, I mean, robustness at Harvard, but there are a number of centers that are working on some of these issues. Um, well, so years ago, there used to be funded by the Mellon Foundation with a wonderful um, person in charge of grant making um, and in consolidation with, or at least in some sort of alignment with the Institute of Medicine, that we could do this with or without the National Academy. Uh, but there's, um, they were these conferences where people would come and talk about their work. Um, so it is, and they would be people like us and then people like the ones that are on the, this call and then um, colleagues and friends and relations who are teaching and have um, field experience and are writing about it. And they, we would do this twice a year in Washington. I mean, mm -hmm. it was funded by a foundation, the Mellon Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me there could be some sort of collective grant where we could have um, this sort of arrangement um, and jumpstart it again. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, the grants manager was a phenomenal woman called Carol, Carolyn Makinson who has retired. Uh, but there would be, there've got to be other fabulous officials in some of these foundations who might find this really mm -hmm. unappealing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to say that uh, I don't think, uh, Lynn, did you freeze? Oh, dear. Maybe he's self-censoring because he's about <laughs> to be critical. <laughs> uh, while we're waiting for Lynn to come back, there's a specific question in the chat about in, impending conflict. I know Jennifer and, and you, Amy, as well, have, have expressed interest in this before. That is, you know, what are the uh, indicators of impending conflict? And the, the, there's also a related question about what is the United Nations Conflict Monitoring Center apparently in New York, uh, what is their status in terms of uh, monitoring uh, uh, impending conflict? And again, relates to what you were saying earlier, Jennifer, in terms of early warning yeah, signs. I'm sorry, all of a sudden I didn't get cut out. Uh, Len, Len, uh, hold off just a second, Len. Uh, we're just going into another area we'll come back to in just a moment. But I was asking about the issue of impending conflict and um, the work that's currently being done for, um, you know, on that issue. Well, it overlaps with the uh, communities that I'm working with um, a lot right now on um, a prevention of mass atrocity crimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is really pivots on sophisticated early warning. Mm -hmm. The UN came out in 2014 with um, a, a framework for prevention of uh, mass atrocities. It's a, it, it, the document is, is called Framework of Analysis, UN 2014. Um, prevention of atrocity crimes. It is the most, it's about 15 pages lucid, um, completely based in the literature. And it is the most um, comprehensive and uh, powerful document I have read for how you can look at a country and figure out on 10 parameters um, where they are, 10 parameters that then goes into smaller subtext and bullets but it's all coherent. It's, it's, the, it's a lucid um, and powerful document. And I'm, I'm using that for a lot of the work I do. That is, um, where is a particular country on a path towards mass atrocity? And the deal is that it, a lot of countries are closer than they might want to think. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be worthwhile for people to look at it just to, Look at the United States through that. Right, right. Jennifer, could you put uh, just a description of that, if not an actual link into the chat? Yeah, sure. Uh, even the name. Okay. Amy, you wanted to say something and I'll go to yeah, you. Let me just jump in on that. Um, of course, as we creep up on the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, there was plenty of warning for that atrocity. And millions and millions of people worldwide engaged politically to try to stop it. And of course, all of us have to get much more comfortable in the political arena. But one of the contributions then I thought that was important was the organization MedAct in Britain produced a health impact assessment 
right. of what the anticipated harms might be of invading Iraq, which was a very interesting document. And knowing that it came from an anti-war organization, it was all the more remarkable how much they underestimated how terrible the effects would be. Um, but Marion Birch, I think, deserves a lot of credit for having launched that effort and um, publishing about that project subsequently and how we might use that tool in future conflicts. Yeah, excellent. Len, I do want to get back to you. I know you were yeah. interrupted by technical difficulties a few minutes ago. Please go ahead. I, I was just suggesting that that um, like-minded people can follow up with each other. And the new organization that Amy was talking about could be a forum for that, to, to, to share ideas, share what they're doing, uh, and develop strategies at their own universities. Yeah, it's really a question for Amy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Keith Martin, the uh, CEO of the uh, Consortium of University for Global Health, uh, asks in the chat, how can we be more effective in mobilizing academia to advocate publicly and politically to implement diplomatic efforts to prevent conflict? Wondering if uh, Amy, Jennifer or Len, do you want to address that? Well, I'll just applaud CUGH for putting on this webinar at all. I think elevating the prestige of this topic is much more important than it probably should be. <laughs> um, this shouldn't be driven by a sense of prestige. But, you know, as we try to build this field, there are markers in a field of how we're making progress. Are there conferences? Are there journals? Are, is there funding? Are there courses being taught? Those sort of markers are very important. And I think we're finally starting to get some traction on advancing in each of those areas. Len or Jennifer, do you want to comment on what universities could do to promote di uh, diplomacy? Well, um, I think, um, oh, Jennifer, ahead. go ahead. Please, Leonard, I, Len, I'm just, Assembly my thoughts, please go. You know, I think uh, universities like other institutions are subject to various kinds of pressures, uh, including uh, from faculty and students. And I think uh, calling on universities to be more active may not always succeed, but I think over time uh, it can, and as they see others able to uh, maintain their uh, reputation, as it were, uh, and not find themselves uh, vilified, I think, uh, which they want to avoid, uh, that they get more comfortable with doing it. it. It's kind of once you do it, it becomes easier to do the next time. And I think they can be pushed uh, to do something easy, like the Ukraine letter, that was not a hard letter to write to, to get people to sign because it was so obvious, but it makes it easier the more they get used to it. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you, Len. Jennifer? Uh, yes, I, I think I, I agree with um, with Len and, and Amy. Um, uh, this is going to be easier um, than it sounds once we start it. I mean, if there if there's if there's convening either virtually um, or in person or subsets of in person that then convene more uh, in larger groups, uh, I I I sense there's a, a great interest in this. When we were trying to get Harvard to um, open up its doors for all the scholars, quote unquote, coming out of Afghanistan, you know, after our the U.S. abrupt withdrawal. Um, scholars and people who had worked with um, in any way as teachers who could be somewhat um, uh, seen by the universities as academics who would bring value to a university campus. I mean, it was through that lens that we had to frame it. Um, we, um, uh, the scholars at risk program that we have was, was mobilized and it was very good, but it was small. Um, I was disappointed and um, tried to push more, but Harvard was going through many things, um, and it was still sort of COVID. Uh, but the universities should be bringing in um, many, many refugees and have them in various ways where they're teaching assistants or um, 
Uh, there are NGOs and organizations that are close by. I'm just I'm just saying civil society, society including universities, um, need to have people who could benefit from coming to universities and then house them, um, have them begin to teach undergraduates or be participating courses, just the sorts of things you're doing, Amy, um, and, but on a larger scale. Um, I think that will have, you know, really, really good, uh, powerful knock-on effects and also need not be requiring vast amounts of money. Yeah, it's a real win-win situation where everyone could benefit, yeah. We have a little less than five minutes left. I want to want to give each of you um, a minute or so to and to either emphasize something you've talked about or touch on something that we may have overlooked. Um, Amy, would you like to go first? Well, it's just been such a pleasure to work with each of you on putting this together and in other arenas. Uh, I encourage everybody in the room to to join some organization or entity that is advancing this field. There are many opportunities. Um, get your universities to join the Safeguarding Health and Conflict Coalition or the Global Alliance on War, Conflict, and Health. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Len? Len, did you have any final? Um, I, I, would, I just um, wanted to note there are some questions that we didn't get to that were raised in the Q&A. And, um, I just want to encourage uh, anyone who goes post a question to get in touch with one or all of us, and we'll get back to you. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Jennifer. Yes, I was distracted um, by trying to see if I could answer people. They're great questions, so maybe um, there could be some collective effort where where these are um, brought to our collective attention, and we can have answers. Amy, yeah. Yeah. You. yeah. Would that be possible? Because uh, this is. This is a, actually a very good opportunity to begin to network. Yeah, with the absolutely. Yeah, okay, so yeah. That would be, I'm agreeing, Len, with you. Yeah. Um, and I, I also think that um, it, uh, Amy, you haven't volunteered. You've in, implicitly started the ball rolling on this, I think, but you haven't volunteered to be a focal point for how we might convene mm -hmm. together. But I, I really do believe that that you know regionally, and not everybody traveling from you know Seattle to has to come to universe, come to D.C. you know Washington, um, but places where some of us now post COVID could get together and begin to brainstorm about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how we could build programs, how we could link collaboratively with each other. Right. Um, I, I think this would be a very important contribution. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. And, and by the way, we're already thinking of, uh, among many other things, an, another CUGH uh, uh, webinar uh, in April and uh, perhaps other events uh, uh, in, in partnership with uh, uh, CUGH and the other organizations represented on, on this webinar. Uh, in closing, I want to thank each of you. I want to thank all the participants. I also specifically want to thank uh, Keith Martin, Steve Hargarten, uh, without whom uh, this webinar would not have taken place, and particularly thank Jenna Smith for all her uh, administrative assistance and support. So um, onward. Uh, I see this as a, a part of a continuing chain of events uh, uh, to move the ball and, and work towards uh, uh, the prevention of war and the promotion of peace. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you Barry. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.